Vera, do you hear me? <laughs> Thank you, Vera, for this kind introduction. Um, and uh, thank you also organizers uh, for making it possible. Um, well, while uh, the two uh, uh, former uh, speakers were kind of in line of each other, uh, my talk will be on a totally kind of seemingly unrelated topic, but uh, it has everything I think to do uh, with the question what, uh, uh, what anthropology was produced by this uh, great Soviet project. Uh, let me start with uh, citing the organizer of uh, this conference, uh, Paul Gavriluk, who is uh, <laughs> amidst of us. Uh, I quote, the task of contemporary theology is to combine the uh, penetrating patristic analysis of the dynamics of moral evil uh, with modern sensitivity to cases of horrendous evil and uh, undeserved suffering, end of the quote. In fact, uh, as Vera told, uh, I've been engaged in this kind of uh, task for the past uh, 10 years uh, with, the, with an uh, interdisciplinary sorry, team of colleagues. We are developing the new research field of interdisciplinary and interreligious post-Soviet theology with the project Theology after the Gulag as the first step. In my talk, I will discuss some difficulties in combining the patristic moral or ethical conception of evil, as Paul proposes in the starting quote, with the phenomenon of extreme dehumanization as experienced in, this in uh, the Soviet Gulag and all other places of extreme suffering. First, I briefly sketch the historical background. Gulag, as all of you uh, uh, probably know, is a Russian acro acronym for Chief Administration of Corrective Labor Camps and Labor Settlement in the former Soviet Union. This camp system was inclusive in regard of ethnic, social, or any other background of victims as well as employees of the Soviet state apparatus. It has come to symbolize the dehumanizing Soviet regime as a whole. Just to bring in the topic of memory and commemoration, I briefly mentioned the problem with statistics uh, of victims of Soviet terror. In his Gulag Archipelago, Alexander Solzhenitsyn uh, had posited the expectation of 60 millions, mi million victims of Soviet uh, terror overall. Scholarly uh, estimates vary from tw uh, twel 12 million to 20 million to 40 million. Concerning the Gulag sp uh, specifically, the well-known uh, historian Anne Applebaum carefully but hesitantly estimates, quote, the total number of forced labors in the USSR from 1929 to 1953, the year of Stalin's death, as 28.7 million people, and the number of deadly victims, ab about 2.75 million, end of the quote. While it is, of course, very important to determine exact figures of the terror, the discrepancy between the need to remember each individual victim and the anonymity and uncertainty, uh, uncertainty of statistics is the real historical background for my discussion of extreme dehumanization today. As a systematic theologian, and I'm a Western systematic theologian, I concentrate on the challenge of extreme dehumanization to theological anthropology, in particular to the doctrines of man as image and likeness of God and of free will. Today, I will put the testimony of the Russian writer Varlam Shalamov against the background of contemporary models of man as God's image and Maximus the Confessor as a patristic representative. Finally, I will raise the theological notion of the permeation of creation with uh, divine energies as a possible direction for combining orthodox theology with contemporary insights. Uh, my first uh, point, dehumanization in the Gulag, the testimony of Shalamov. Extreme dehumanization can be summarized with the testimony of the writer Varlam Shalamov, who spent 17 years in the Gulag. Shalamov is guided in his uh, prose and in his poetry as well by his confrontation with a human condition in which extreme exhaustion led to, quote, the last border beyond which nothing human is left to man, only mistrust, rage, and lies, end of the quote. In the Auschwitz testimony of Primo Levi, we find a similar description of this living dead, uh, Muslimaner in, 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 in the Nazi camps, the Khadegi in the Russian camps, with an in, in important shift of accent, I quote, non-men who march and labor in silence, the divine spark dead within them, already 
too empty really to suffer. End of the quote. As Shalamov notes, the ethical norm which applies in this human condition is, quote, worse things exist than eating human flesh. End of the quote. Существуют вещи и похуже, чем питаться человеческим мясом. All emotions, so virtues and vices, Shalamov writes, love, friendship, envy, compassion, longing for fame, honesty, had left the living dead. I quote, bitterness was the last feeling with which men departed into non-being, into the world of the dead, end of the quote. Eventually, language and memory disappeared, and lastly, the an intellect. Most terrifying of Shalamov's testimony is, is that anyone is subject to dehumanization, regardless of social, educational, or religious background. Shalamov writes that by severe, quote, cold, hunger, and sleeplessness, working 16 hours a day, seven days a week, and being constantly beaten up by convoy and criminals, healthy young men became living dead within 20 to 30 days, end of the quote. These terms are repeatedly tested. Shalamov's narrator adds laconically. While dehumanization is unconditional, it is also universal. It happened not only in the camps. It is testified for any place and any time where a human being is exposed to extreme exhaustion. It means it ca happens at this very moment. Theologically, what Shalamov calls everything human in man can be called God's image in man, as also suggested by the divine spark of Primo Levi and by everything we actually learn from patristic theology. The loss of everything human in man challenges theological anthropology, in particular the doctrine of human essence and being, being created in God's image, Imago Dei, to which I now will turn. But I'd like first to make a heuristic distinction between, perhaps a bit, a bit difficult, actual reality, ontics, and the ordering of theory of reality, ontology, so that we can uh, uh, focus uh, uh, um, our discourse. So ontics is real reality, and uh, the ordering of reality in, in my discourse is ontology. I turn to the image of God. Uh, none of the three contemporary academic models of God's image dares to address God's image for real, ontic, as a kind of quality or substance that is inherent in the human being. I mean here the functional model that stresses human stewardship over creation, the relational model that stresses the relation between God and man, and the dynamic model that stresses the spiritual vocation of man to co-work with God. The ontic understanding of God's image belongs to the oldest substantive model, which is common to Maximus the Confessor and other church fathers. Of course, these four models overlap. The difference seems to be which aspect is being stressed. While within contemporary scientific debates it is difficult to claim a distinct quality in man, my logic is very simple. If this most human that we call the image of God can disappear, then it was there in the first place, ontically. This means we are held to reconsider a substantive understanding in our discourse on God's image. This may not come as a revelation to orthodox theologians, but it certainly is for Western theological discussions of Imago Dei. But, the position, uh, but the posi uh, my position also applies to an ongoing discussion in Maximus studies. The discovery of a substantive I image of God pleads in favor of the distinction between the logos as the principle of being of man and the tropos as his uh, mode of existence as summarized by Andrew Louth, quote, uh, who we are as persons is a matter both of our logos of essence and of our tropos of existing, end of the quote. Now, some, uh, some scholars suggest that Maximus uh, opposes essence and existence and locates the image of God at the level of existence. But uh, this understanding does not expa explain anything about the loss nor about the regaining of uh, the human features, the image of God in the living dead. It also fails in view of severely mentally disordered people because if from this understanding I would follow the substantive model, as the phenomenon of dehumanization compels me to do, I would have to uh, conclude that uh, they do not have an image of God. And of course, it is unthinkable to go there. Therefore, I have to search for, an, uh, for, for, for another way. And this, I, uh, I think, um, I think uh, an elaboration of the substantive model inspired by the patristic notions of God's image and likeness, uh, found also in Maximus, 
can offer a direction for thinking about the challenge of the loss of everything human and man. Very briefly put, while the image is uh, inviolable, it is the likeness that can disappear. In Maxima's theological anthropology, this is interconnected with several key notions, which I have no time to elaborate uh, here, but uh, which will be familiar to most of you. To the image uh, belongs no belong notions uh, like logos, being, and general will. To the likeness belong tropos, well-being, or evil being, and the exercise of free will. And here is the point where we have to face the tension between the moral or ethical and the ontic ontic implication of uh, dehumanization. So I turn to free will and uh, deification. One evident challenge concerns free will. In Maximus and patristic theology, free will belongs to the tropos and is uh, necessary in developing the, vir uh, the virtues to attain God's likeness on the way to deification, uh, deification being the true uh, goal of human uh, life. At the same time, patristic theology considers the will as the source of evil. Metropolitan uh, Callistus Ware noted uh, that evil, I quote, is the twisting and uh, misappropriation of what is uh, in itself good. Evil resists not in the thing itself, but in our attitude towards the thing, that is to say, in our will, end of the quote. And Paul Gavriluk again uh, summarizes uh, uh, that, quote, all patristic authors agreed that uh, evil was uh, 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 co causally connected to the misuse of free will, although their, uh, uh, their accounts of the fall differed considerably, end of the quote. Essentially, evil has no ontic status, no being. Now, when we take dehumanization ontically, it becomes difficult to combine the moral conceptions of evil through free will with the exercise of the free will towards deification. As far as I see, Mac Maximus uh, does not consider a state where a person loses the likeness not through free will, but through external circumstan circumstances. And if some of you uh, know the source of Maximus, where I, I can find the opposite thought, uh, most welcome. But in extreme dehumanization, free will is uh, out of the question, as well as the character state of receptivity for exercising the virtues. This condition is not covered by ethics or by virtues in the way Maximus conceives of them. So we have to think, rethink Maximus' framework. Our discourse of the virtues and of ethics has to be consistently grounded, I think, in ontics and considered within ontology. Otherwise, we might, uh, might end up with cheap grace theology, to uh, remember Bonhoeffer, that doesn't hold in view of testimonies of uh, the loss of everything human in man, as ontic. We certainly cannot call extreme dehumanization a character state in uh, the Mac Maximian or Aristotelian sense. Free will no longer exists, and it is not an issue of virtue and vice anymore, and I would argue not even of sin. It belongs to other ontic structures, but to which? We deal here with a condition beyond the fall, beyond ethics of free or, or free will. This insight leads uh, to another challenge. What does this ontic loss mean for deification as the ethical goal? In order not to slip into an ethical discussion of dehumanization, we must pose this question. I'd like to refer uh, to Maximus in Ambiguum uh, 4, I quote, creatures receive well-being through virtue and through their uh, direct uh, progress towards the logos according to which they exist, or they receive ill-being through wise and their uh, uh, movement contrary to the logos by which they exist, end of the quote. But again, what when these notions of well-being or ill-being do not apply? In view of uh, these uh, questions, Ma Maximus' idea that summarizing Atalassium 59, quote, the Logos wa uh, wants the redemption, uh, redemption of all and deifies human nature in itself towards the uh, goal and uh, for this reason, in the end, he unites with all, both with those worthy and those unworthy, end of the quote, is problematic as the conception of worthy and unworthy remains within this ethical and not within an uh, ontic discourse. Moreover, Maximus explicitly connects uh, it to the person's receptivity, which is totally lost in a living dead. And now 
now I turn to permeation of creation uh, with divine energies. In order to avoid such an ethical reading, I see a, pot a great potential, uh, really, in another, uh, in another direction, in the panentheistic orthodox conception of God. In this teaching, God's essence remains absolutely transcendence, uh, transcendent while uh, creation is permeated by divine immanent energies or logoi, as in Maximus. I consider this teaching a missing link in current debates on deification and God's image. Uh, Irina uh, uh, Piart uh, 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 referred today already to Callistus Weir, who uh, uh, spoke yesterday about the salvation of all and not uh, deification of one man. Uh, this teaching of permission of creation with uh, divine uh, uh, energies uh, uh, can be summarized in the orthodox invocation which precedes most individual and uh, communal worship in which the Holy Spirit is described as everywhere present and filling all things. This worldview can contribute, uh, I think, to rethinking man's place in and connectedness with creation. It also can positively contribute to post totalitarian reflection on uh, complicity in guilt and in suffering. The permeation of creation with divine energies presupposes the ontic unity of creation. This starting point stresses the ontic rather than the ethical basis for deification and uh, shifts the accent to individual responsibility for the other human beings and for the whole of creation. This is a totally different axiology than in contemporary post-traumatic theologies, such as the highly valuable theology in Auschwitz and post-apartheid uh, apartheid theology, from which a post-Soviet theology should learn a lot. Individual responsibility for evil should be explicitly perceived as an intrinsic ontological given from the ontic unity of creation, while even in this the theology, uh, while even in these theologies, complicity in, gil in guilt is underarticulated ontologically and therefore ri risks uh, to remain confined to mere ethics. But as I argued, this ontological dimension is, uh, is also underarticulated in church fathers like Maximus, uh, whose con uh, conception of evil and suffering tends to slip into uh, ethics, as is clear in confrontation with testimonies of extreme dehumanization. Paradoxically, the teaching of the unity of creation implies an ethical pri primacy of respect, uh, respecting the singularity of any suffering over an ontological conception which would risk abstracting from reality in the name of essence, thereby misusing the notion of essence. For this reason, a theological locus, uh, uh, that is a dogmatic uh, theme or notion which gets uh, an accent and which we have to articulate and justify in relation to uh, other themes or uh, lotsi is in the case of extreme dehumanization by rotation, in turn, ontology and ethics, and should be discussed uh, as such as the concept of God, uh, along, uh, alongside the co concept of God, anthropology, Christology, and soteriology, uh, soteriology since they are interconnected. The implication of dehumanization would be that even if only one individual person l l loses her likeness, this affects the ontic connection between image and likeness, logos and tropos, not only in the individual, but also in all of creation. We cannot apply the doctrine like uh, statistics or in conceptual sense as uh, in the classical Soritas uh, paradox, which says that uh, when you have a heap uh, of sand and you take away one grain, it is still a heap, and if you take away uh, uh, two, it is still a heap, and so on. The guiding dogmatic imp imperative can be express, expressed with the words of the English poet John Donne, quote, every man's death diminishes me, end of the quote. But then again, not ethically, but start starting with ontics. Thus, in a paradoxical way, the ethical view of evil is transferred, uh, tr transferred to an awareness that, to speak with Dostoevsky, each of us is guilty before everyone, and I am the guiltiest of all. This awareness requires the whole person who, in the face of evil, doesn't point to others but starts with him or herself. The way to know God is not philosophy but practice, and this we learn from Orthodox theology. This um, changes the, uh, the accent of the goal of deification from uh, doing it for yourself, being deified individually, to doing it for the whole creation and for, for uh, the, uh, him who suffers and, do, uh, and, and doesn't have any faculties for deification or free will. This strictly individual responsibility for evil is uh, based on both a metaphysical 
ontological connection with Christ and an ethical orientation towards Christ. But while we eventually say that Christ did suffer for each individual and all creation, in our theological discourse it takes a lot after the extreme dehumanization to, s to, to, to say eco homo, see the man, and to be credible. And credibility is also a very important task for contemporary theology. Thank you.